Good evening. Okay, so welcome to those that are able to make it to the house of the Lord tonight, and also to those online. Let's start our service by a hymn, a reminder of what we are here for. Brethren, we have met to worship. Let's stand and sing together our first hymn tonight. Thank you. Aaron, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? For is man unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down? Let's pray to open our service tonight. Dear Holy Father, thank you for bringing us to the, together tonight. For, thank you for the great weather outside, and we pray for the Spirit here tonight. They be with us, be among us, speak to us, keep us, hold us up. Teach us, O oh Lord, your way, so we may walk and obedient to you, according to the grace that in Christ Jesus our Lord. And thank you for all that are here. And please be with us and we serve you tonight with our spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. So, since the main theme for tonight is God's sovereignty will in salvation, and the title is The Humbling of a King, I advise it's impossible to talk about God's will for us without talking about us being humbled in front of our God. Because we, as human beings, have been given this incredible gift called free will from God. But it is quite often where we know, and God does make sure we know, that our will do not align with God. For a natural man, we ignore God and do whatever he wants, because he is his own God, who worships and serves the creation more than the creature, more than creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans chapter 1, verse 25. But we being born of God by the Spirit in Christ Jesus, being given power to overcome and crucify the sinful desires of the flesh on that cross, to die in the flesh and live unto God in the Spirit, to serve the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But how do we do that? 
by humbling ourselves, putting his will above our will, to pray, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And tonight, if the Lord's willing, we will hear the words preached by Peter about how one of the greatest king of one of the greatest empire to ever walk the earth, humbling himself to the king of kings and lord of lords. Because our God is just that great. He changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and set up kings. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He has the power to help and to cast down. Second Chronicles chapter 25, verse 8. So with that in mind, we will sing our next hymn tonight about blessing to our great God, 10,000 reasons. Please be seated. Thank you. Good singing. Um, and now it's time for announcement. Thanks, Pastor. Nothing under the ordinary for our announcements this evening. Uh, Brother Peter is going to be speaking to us, as you already know, on God's sovereignty and salvation. Um, Tuesday evening, we are still having our prayer meeting here at 730. And so I uh, hope and encourage you to be there. A few of us will be missing, so the the more who can come will be a blessing and a help uh, in many ways, by the way. I encourage you to be there. Uh, Wednesday, we have our bread ministry from 4.45 to 5.15. If you want to come and set up for that, if you want to help hand out some tracts and be an encouragement, if you want to listen to a brief message and uh, encourage others to hear the gospel, I invite you to come to that. That's Wednesday. If you want to be here about quarter to five on Wednesday, it's just a short one. Uh, by 5.15, 5.30, you'd be out of here. And it's a good opportunity for you to serve the Lord. Um, uh, there are some ministries, such as our Sunday school, our youth meetings, and our Thursday Bible study, which are um, taking a break for the school holidays. So that's the end of our announcements. 
We are going to take up our offering now, so I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing on this time of worship and giving to him in our offering. Father, we are thankful to be able to worship you in many ways. We've been able to sing to you. We've been able to thank you in song, in prayer, in attention to your word as it was read, and in many ways, even in serving one another before our service began, we meet and gather for your purposes. This is your church, and we want to please you. So, Father, we, um, we praise your name, and we ask that you would be magnified and blessed in this congregation this evening. Lord, we ask for our offering now as we give to you as another way for us to worship you. May you be praised by our giving and our spirit that we do it with. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> We had an opportunity to sing one more hymn before the preaching of the word, and I have chosen, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Because this is about being humble, to realize all that we have and we can are of the Lord, and to rely on a Savior all the days of our life, because we live by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. I can sing, All is mine, and all the night has been won and I shall overcome. But yet not I, but through Christ in me. So please stand, you're able, and sing with me. Thank you. Oh, 
Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Kenny, for those wonderful songs that you chose. Especially the one we just sang. <laughs> what a great song. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all again tonight. We're going to continue on in the book of Daniel. We're coming now to chapter 4. A chapter which I consider to be a highlight chapter among many highlight chapters of this wonderful book. In each of the first three chapters, we've seen God work miraculously on behalf of his people. In chapter 1, we saw how God brought Daniel and his three friends, while mere youths, to Babylon to be among the first contingent of exiles. God organised a placement of them into key positions of influence within the king's court so they could look out for the well-being of his people who would arrive after them. It would be a comfort and encouragement to the Jewish exiles to know that God had not abandoned them even though they had sorely vexed him. Reminding us of the words of the prophet Habakkuk's prayer concerning the still coming judgment upon Judah, in wrath, remember mercy. God wants his people to be reminded that in his sovereignty, he still cares for them and will continue to do so. Then in chapter 2, we saw God's sovereignty in both the giving of the, of the prophetic dream concerning the four Gentile nations to the king and the revealing of its meaning to Daniel the message being that God is sovereign over all nations of the world throughout the course of human history. God alone possesses the power to both raise a nation and to bring it down again. Then in chapter 3, we again encountered God's sovereignty in the incident of the fiery furnace, when God overruled the king's edict by supernaturally protecting Daniel's three friends from the fire. The flames simply had no hold over them. And tonight, we will see God's sovereignty on display once more. This time in a very personal way in the life of an individual man, King Nebuchadnezzar himself. You've already heard the title of the message is The Humbling of a King, but I put the subtitle to that as God's Sovereignty in Salvation. Before we proceed, let's dedicate this time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we come before you. We thank you that we are conscious that we can do nothing apart from your spirit, apart from your power, apart from your grace. So we pray, Lord, be with us this evening. Guide me as I open up your word. Lord, open up your word to us that we may know more of you, that we may see more of you, that we may come to know you better, that we may love you more, honour you and follow you. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus. Be with us and guide us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. In a few moments, we're going to read all of chapter 4 together. I know it's quite a bit. <laughs> we'll get through it. And as we do, I'd ask you to keep in mind that what we're listening to are the inspired words of God. In this instance, a royal proclamation given by the king of Babylon, the mightiest ruler of his day to be unashamedly read to every man, woman and child throughout his kingdom. So please be aware of that as we read it, even though they're the words of Nebuchadnezzar. Reading chapter 4 of Daniel, if you're able, I'd ask you to please stand as we do read God's word together. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the most high God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his domain is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my, in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. 
Therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band, a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man, let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished, for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves who were lovely and its, and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven and their, sorry, of birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and a tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king. They shall drive you from your men, from men, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall, wet, they shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the commandment to leave the stump and root of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules." Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. 
All this came upon the king, upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the twelve months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws." And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honour and splendour returned to me. My counsellors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice and those who walk in him in pride he is able to put down. Thank you. Please be seated. May the Lord bless his word to us this evening. My approach in tonight's message will not be to touch upon every verse but to focus our attention on some key points and how they apply to us today. Now, this is the second time God gave the king a night vision, which he needs to have interpreted. So there's similarity in this regard between the narrative of chapter 2 and this chapter. But apart from the specific details of the two dreams, which are, of course, very different, there's also a great difference in how the king reacts. In the first dream, the king was terrified by his dream and frantically ordered all his counsellors and wise men to appear before him demanding that they first reveal the dream itself and then its interpretation. Failure to do so would result in their death. To put things into perspective, the time gap between the two dreams is more than 30 years and Daniel is now around 50 years of age. During this time, Nebuchadnezzar would have had ample opportunity to benefit from Daniel's wise and godly counsel as well as to observe his godly behaviour and personal integrity. And so at the outset, we notice that although this second dream also causes the king to be greatly concerned, just like the first, this time the king appears to be much more composed. Firstly, we note that he doesn't berate or threaten his counsellors when they're unable to interpret his dream. We may ask, why did he bother retaining them at all? since they failed him so miserably last time? And why was he again asking for the counsel on such a matter? He knew that Daniel was the only one who could provide what he needed. The answer may lie in the dream itself, which is actually not a very complicated one. The king likely would have guessed that the tree, the great tree, together with all the benefits he provided, represented himself. And this would have pleased him. But the second part of the dream would have given him cause for concern. And he would have been anxious to understand exactly what the felling of the tree and stripping of its branches and leaves foreshadowed. He suspected it probably wasn't good news for him. And so he may have sought out his wise men first in the hope that they might somehow soften the blow. They very likely could have provided the king with an, an interpretation of sorts. 
but in discerning the foreboding nature of the dream, they would have understandably been reluctant to deliver such negative news to the king, for displeasing a king carried great risks. And so they remain silent, and the king finally has Daniel called in. Before we turn our attention to the meaning of the dream, I first want us to notice how Nebuchadnezzar relates to Daniel. We note that he records Daniel's Hebrew name twice in this proclamation, in verse 8 and again in verse 19. It seems that the king wants the subjects of his realm to clearly understand that the person he praises as the one in whom is the spirit of the holy God is none other than one of the Hebrew exiles. It is a mark of respect that shouldn't go unnoticed by us. And we also note that Daniel is no longer included within the group of wise men and magicians, indicating that he's no longer required to be in regular attendance at court. Being referred to as chief of the magicians didn't mean that he had authority over them, but that he was wiser than them all. And the most likely explanation for Daniel being called in separately is that he had been promoted into a senior position in charge of administering the affairs of the state, a position denoting the trust which the king had placed in Daniel. <coughs> Furthermore, we cannot but notice the manner in which Daniel relates to the king. He immediately understands the meaning of the dream, of course, but verse 19 tells us that he is astonished, better translated as stunned or devastated, and his thoughts troubled or terrified him. Daniel was so alarmed at what this dream meant for the king that it caused him to be reluctant to pronounce such bad news. If we transport ourselves into this scene, we see Daniel and the king peering at each other intently, the king discerning the distress upon Daniel's face. And in what can only be described as a touching gesture, the king reassures Daniel not to be concerned, but to simply speak the truth, even if it was bad news for him. Some commentators suggest Daniel hesitates out of fear for any negative repercussion upon himself, but I believe it's much more likely that Daniel is simply grieved to have to give this difficult news to the king, whom he's come to care for, even as a friend, though an unsaved friend. Hence he starts out by declaring sincerely, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. No doubt, Daniel has been praying for the salvation of the king these many years, and the king has also come to greatly respect Daniel, likely seeing in him a truly loyal subject, if not also a friend, a very rare commodity among the intrigues of the high court of Babylon. Daniel's deep concern for the king is apparent, since after he finishes telling the king the interpretation of the dream, and without any thought for his own personal situation, he undertakes a truly courageous act in daring to exhort the king to take his advice by repenting of his sinful ways. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. It's hard to imagine anyone but Daniel being able to speak to the king in such a manner, especially in open court in front of all his counsellors and not receiving an instant death sentence. But the king patiently listens to Daniel instead, knowing full well he's speaking to him out of deep and genuine concern. Daniel perfectly models Paul's injunction to speak the truth in love. I have just two principal observations to bring out regarding tonight's passage. The first concerns the dream itself, what I refer to as the external aspect. The meaning of the dream is relatively straightforward and we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. God gives Nebuchadnezzar a warning by way of a dream. Reform your ways or suffer severe chastisement. The tree represents the king has grown mighty and both he and his empire have prospered. 
The date of the dream is thought to be around 570 BC, by which time the king had subdued his enemies on all sides and is now enjoying relative peace. He therefore turns his attention to beautifying the city of Babylon where he resides in the royal palace, as well as leaving a magnificent legacy to himself. That the king was a mighty warrior general is a matter of history. But what was not understood until relatively recently from archaeological discoveries is that he was also just as great a builder, if not even more so. Some points to support this, and I'll ask John to show the first slide. We can show just a couple of slides. Nebuchadnezzar undertook the rebuilding of Babylon to such a degree that it had acquired a great renown far and wide, with famed hanging gardens, which you can see here, which he built for his median wife, Amethyst, regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the second slide, John. He built the ziggurat, which was a stepped pyramid, within the city as a place of religious worship. It was 288 feet high and constructed from approximately 60 million bricks. On top was a gold statue to his god Marduk, weighing 52,000 pounds. The city was protected by a huge double-walled system, 25 feet thick, separated by a 40-foot gap, and fortified with 260 towers, 160 feet apart. He built a grand procession street, 70 feet wide, with a 35-foot high Ishtar gate as its entrance, all decorated with glazed tiles, incorporating life-size images of lions and dragons, the emblems of the Babylonian Empire. So it's not surprising, therefore, that the pagan king was puffed up in pride, exceedingly proud of all his various achievements. The meaning of the dream announced to him by watchers referring to angels was really quite straightforward. Give honour to God to whom it belongs and not yourself. If you fail to do so, God will directly intervene in your life by taking away your mind, your sanity, and replacing it with the degrading mind of an animal. We see that the dream becomes personal in verse 16, where the terminology changes from referring to the tree as it, now to his and him, he referring to Nebuchadnezzar, will be given the heart of a beast. He's told that this will continue for a period of seven times so that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. God's purpose in chastening and humbling the king so was that all people, the living, would understand that the living God, the God of the Hebrews, was the only true God rather than their pagan idols because it is he who is the most high, it is he who places the people he wishes into positions of authority. So there's nothing for any ruler to boast about, because if he wills, God can place even the lowliest or least naturally qualified of men into such a position. Nebuchadnezzar has been duly warned, but he fails to properly heed the warning. Over the past few decades, Nebuchadnezzar had heard of and was familiar with the true God from an intellectual perspective, even admitting the superiority of Yahweh on at least two occasions, and yet he still did not submit to him. Like the people on Mars Hill recorded in Acts chapter 17, who responded to Paul's preaching of the true God, whom he equated to their unknown God, by replying, we will hear you again on this matter. So was King Nebuchadnezzar's response. The king had heard the truth, and deep down he instinctively sensed there was something very different about this God of the Jews, something which demanded serious attention. Yet he decided to delay instead and focus on other things which drew his interest. 
Unfortunately, this is a common reaction for many who hear the truth, who for whatever reason ignore the inner witness of their conscience and put off responding in the way they know they really should. The Bible tells us that to respond in this way is foolish or rash because none of us know when our allotted time on this earth will run out and who is to say whether God will provide another opportune occasion for the gospel to be received. Many commonly assume that there will always be a later time which better suits them to make that simple decision for Christ in response to which God must return the favour by granting them access to his kingdom. But this is counter to the clear teaching of the Bible, which emphasises the imperative command to respond sincerely and immediately to the gospel call without delay. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And so we've seen King Nebuchadnezzar on two occasions confronted with the undeniable reality that the God of the Jews was not one to be trifled with and one who could not be controlled or manipulated by men. And even more than this, that he was unparalleled in both wisdom and power. Yet despite these two supernatural revelations, the king continued on his own path, apparently not considering this Jewish God any further content to simply placate him, or so he thinks. And so, 12 months later, after having returned home, flushed with victory from putting down an uprising in Egypt, he once again finds himself walking upon that familiar flat roof of his palace, gazing down upon and admiring the dazzling spectacle of the architectural achievements that he has accomplished. And tragically, he finds his heart swell with pride at his own brilliance and impulsively breaks out in praise of himself. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? Babylon is a city full of idols and idol worshippers. And it's obvious that the king's idol was his own self-image. He worshipped himself. In just, in just in the previous chapter, we read that King Nebuchadnezzar built that great idol, that great statue, and he had everyone bow down before it, and they had to do so on pain of death. But really, they were worshipping him, because he was the one who was commanding them. He was the one who had control. A.W. Tozer writes of the sin of idolatry. Among the sins to, among the sins to which the human heart is prone... Hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. For idolatry is at bottom a libel on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is, in itself a monstrous sin, and substitutes for the true God one made after its own likeness. Nebuchadnezzar had made God into the image of himself, a fallen, sinful human creature. One commentator writes, claiming glory for himself constituted the ultimate act of defiance of God. God says through the prophet Isaiah, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Nebuchadnezzar had used his year of grace to work himself up to the, this point of rebellion against the God who had spoken to him twice and who had shown his power in delivering three of his servants from the king's furnace. Punishment was instantaneous. The king's pronouncement was an act of lunacy and lunacy took over his mind. God simply took away from the king what was not his to begin with, his kingdom and his humanity. Again, one more commentator makes this interesting observation. Perhaps one should say that the true insanity belongs to the Nebuchadnezzar who, was er who has earlier been talking as if he were the eternal king and God did not exist. His outward madness is the external expression of a delusion he has already been the tragic victim of. Only a madman thinks he is a king or an emperor. Politics is the house rules of a lunatic asylum. But those rules are important because they make the madness as little harmful as possible. 
God's judgment was swift. And just as he was warned in his dream, so God pronounced sentence upon the king. Now reduced to the status of a madman, driven away from men, or more likely, he re reacted so fierce, fiercely towards people that he couldn't be approached. Living and sleeping out in the open among wild donkeys in the parks within the city walls, his hair growing long and matted and his nails exceedingly long. It's probable and even likely that Daniel ensured he was cared for and protected during his time of madness, lest any usurper might assassinate him and gain the throne. But the dream had, the dream had shown the stump of the tree bound by a band of iron and bronze, signifying that his, drain, his reign would only be suspended, for the stump remained and so his kingdom would eventually be returned back to him. We're not sure exactly how long seven times actually was. Seven days is far too short, and the same Aramaic phrase later in chapter 7, verse 25, refers, equates times to years. So it may have been as long as seven years, but seven months could also conceivably be the case. We cannot say conclusively. But what we can say conclusively is that God is able to humble any person no matter their social standing, power or wealth. And nowhere do we see this presented to us so vividly in scripture as in the book of Revelation. Where Christ's return, this time as mighty king rather than a suffering servant as we just celebrated this past Easter, every nation on earth will bow down before him and he will set up his eternal kingdom ruling over all. If God can subdue na entire nations, what, that, what does that say to each one of us, to every person ever born? Isaiah writes of God's proclamation to all humanity. humanity. Isaiah 45, verses 22 to 25. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, because there's no higher authority God can swear by, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that to me and shall not return that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath or confess allegiance. He shall say, surely in the Lord I have righteousness and strength. To him men shall come and all shall be ashamed who are incensed against him. In the Lord all the descendants of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. Every knee shall bow to God, whether willingly now while in this life, to our eternal glory and joy, or unwillingly in the next life, to their eternal shame and torment. The alternatives are so stark and obvious, but sin makes us stupid at best or irrational, and truly mad at worst as depicted by Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone has a choice to make, and God calls everyone to make the wise choice. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both you and your descendants may live. In Ezekiel 18, verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Turning, of course, denotes repentance. In the time we have left, I'd like to focus upon the second observation, the internal aspect of what's going on with King Nebuchadnezzar, namely the spiritual aspect. Up to the point where he had made his proudful beast boast on the palace rooftop, We've been presented with a picture of a proud and arrogant autocratic ruler who didn't hesitate to ruthlessly punish and oppress his enemies, as well as anyone who displeased him. Despite some redeeming qualities, such as his respect for Daniel and to some extent even for the Jewish God, when judgment finally does fall upon him, we are nevertheless pleased to see it entertaining or possibly even voicing the sentiment well, it's about time he had a coming. But God declares, 
I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. And what we find in this chapter is not final divine wrath being poured out upon him, but we are surprised instead to encounter the mercy of God. The same mercy he extends to every person who comes to him in faith and repentance. To quote Tozer once more, we should banish from our minds forever the common but erroneous notion that justice and judgment characterize the God of Israel, while mercy and grace belong to the Lord of the church. This is a common misconception. God simply does not and cannot change, else he would cease from being God, perfect and holy. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. Although commentators debate whether or not Nebuchadnezzar actually was saved, I believe that this passage is telling us that this is indeed the case. And would even venture to say that I view this chapter as a king's very own testimony. Let me give you six points in support of this view. For one thing, he refers to the Jewish God as the most high God twice in this passage, at the beginning and at the end. He does so in apparent, apparent acknowledgement of the truth of who he is, the true God who reigns above all and over all. Secondly, there's a structure of the proclamation itself. If you, look, if you consider it overall, we notice that it also begins and ends with praise of the true God, making it evident that the focus is not on himself as a human king, but on God as supreme ruler who alone deserves their praise. Understandably, he does not state it as black and white as that, but we must remember that he's addressing a pagan nation, steeped in idolatry over many generations. And so the phrasing needed to be in such a way as to point the people to the truth without provoking an all-out revolt. Whereas he had previously received the, key, the people's accolades of eternal rule over his kingdom, O king, live forever, he begins and ends his decree by acknowledging that it is God's kingdom that is eternal and it is his dominion alone that, kings that, sorry, that continues from generation to generation. Thirdly, there's his confession. What is so amazing is that any king, let alone this king, would ever consider sending a proclamation throughout his realm which portrays himself as such unflattering light. Archaeologists tell us that it is very common for ancient kings to hide any reference to their failures in battle or to, or to anything that may be considered embarrassing. They commonly rewrite history to favour themselves, even if that means falsifying what actually took place. For example, the ancient Egyptians make no mention of either the mass, the mass exodus of around 6 million Jews nor of any large slave population. You just won't find it. But the Bible tells us it's true. But here we have King Nebuchadnezzar, single monarch over the mightiest empire up to that time, composing and issuing a document which brings himself down while at the same time elevating the God of the Jews. This testifies to a wholesale change wrought inside his heart from the boastful and arrogant self-interested person he was, now to one who humbly acknowledges what has happened to him, warts and all. Fourthly, I want to come to what I believe is his conversion. Verse 34 is the pivotal point where he states, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praise the honoured him who lives forever. The form of lunacy which Nebuchadnezzar suffered under is most commonly attributed to one of two psychological conditions. One is zoanthropy, in which the sufferer believes himself to be an animal, it could be any animal, and both, think, both thinks and behaves accordingly. The other is boanthropy, in this case, the sufferer exhibits the outward irrational characteristics of an ox or a cow, but inwardly his mental process remains intact. 
This has been documented medically. If the king had suffered from the former zoanthropy, when his senses returned to it, to him, it would have been as though he had wake, awakened from a dream, recalling the last words he had spoken immediately prior to his insanity and realising from his physical state that God had indeed punished him just as he had threatened. However, if the king had suffered from the latter, boanthropy, then the agony would have been so much the greater. In this case, the condition, his condition, would have exactly corresponded to the picture of the stump or the tree bound by the band of iron and bronze, hemmed inside his own mind, which, con which continued to realise what was going on, Lobs while, all the while observing the external irrationality of his own actions, but unable to control himself. Truly a great ordeal, but one God may have employed in his divine mercy to teach the king his true place, to humble him completely and lead him to call out to God for help and for salvation. It's interesting that the scripture places the order of his restoration as follows. Firstly, I lifted my eyes to heaven and secondly, my understanding returned to me. If this was truly the point of his salvation, we may think that the order is the wrong way around to what we would expect. Namely, that his, that his sanity or understanding would first be restored to him and then he would look up to God and call out to him. But the scriptures also declare us to be dead in trespasses and sins. And yet, we are still able to call upon God for mercy. One commentator puts it, such are the intricacies of God's grace in the human soul. The unlocking of Nebuchadnezzar's mind points to the release of his bondage under sin. Now free to express his gratitude to the one who saved him, namely the Most High God of Heaven. And I blessed the Most High and praised the non him who lives forever. That to me sounds like the, pro like the proclamation of someone who's just come to know the Lord Jesus as his saviour. Description of this verse is also as follows. Verse 34 does not contain words of repentance and confession, but that's obviously implied in the praise the king gives to God. King Nebuchadnezzar's praise of God contains some sound theology. He returned the praise, honour and glory he had demanded for himself to God. He recognised God for who he is, the Most High, the Eternal One. Nebuchadnezzar had encountered the Most High in the person of Daniel and his three friends. Now he had met him personally in his episode of insanity. Fifthly, there's blessing. Verse 36 goes on to tell us how in conceding his lack of worth and his own low condition that God returned to the king even more glory than he had before, reminiscent of God's, of God's generosity to Job. Why would God do this for an unrepentant king? And sixth, sixth point, there is spiritual fruit. But it is in verse 37 that we find a fitting conclusion to the testimony of this once pagan king. The wording of this renders the reader to understand that from now on, that is continuing on without ceasing, without stopping ever again, the king now worships, praises, extols and honours the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride he is able to put down. One commentator summarises it this way. Nebuchadnezzar came to know God in a very real way. He would never again be the same man he was before. We see this in his worshipful praise that he offers up to God. Before this point, he had come to know about God, but now he knew God in a personal way. Nebuchadnezzar does not appear again in the book of Daniel, and it's believed he only lived for a short time after his ordeal, a few years at the most. But how gracious and merciful of God that he took compassion on this lost soul who up to this point had stubbornly refused to acknowledge him as supreme, to bend the knee. 
What amazing grace that God will reach down to take hold of him, to irresistibly draw him to himself and transform his heart so that his first response was loving worship, having come to know the true God now in a most personal way, even as his own saviour. The Apostle John writes of such gracious mercy in quoting Jesus, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Well might Nebuchadnezzar have joined together with David to sing in joyful praise, be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be above all the earth. We've seen the sovereignty of the almighty God on high exhibition throughout the previous chapters, and here we see an even greater demonstration of God's sovereignty, that he remains sovereign in the salvation of men and women, that he is able to humble even the most proud and mighty of men to the point where they come to realise their total insanity and the desperateness of their situation, and thereby cause them to turn and call out to him for his gracious, sovereign mercy. John Walford writes, Certainly God is no respecter of persons and can save the high and mighty in this world as well as the lowly. How do we sum all of this up? Well, God is able to not only crush the pride of unconverted mankind, but mercifully he's also able to save them. We don't rejoice in the destruction of anyone. We want to see everyone come to salvation. Therefore, I hope that this realisation spurs us on to even greater praise than ever for our Saviour, for our own salvation, that he came down, he called us. He turned our, mind, our, uh, he turned our minds aside from insanity to know the truth, to turn the light on in our eyes. That can only come from a changing heart. Only God can do such a thing. What a wonderful miracle that is. And also let it serve us, as it serves a great encouragement as we persevere in praying for the lost, for those we care for, especially our dearly, dear loved ones, that no one is beyond the touch or reach of God. We pray that the Lord touches them and brings them to salvation too. Let's close now in a word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this passage, this great passage. Thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, you do not rejoice. You're not glad to see anyone perish. Your heart is one that desires all to come to you, to bow before you, to humble themselves before you. Oh, how horrible is pride. Lord, take it away from our hearts. Take it away from all those who resist you, Lord, that they may see the wonderful nature of you, your loving nature, your kindness, your mercy. We pray, Lord Jesus, that, Lord, You'd work in our hearts that we may know you better. We may walk more closely with you. We may worship you even more so, Lord, every day. But Lord, we thank you for all those who are lost, the ones that we pray for day in and day out, that your mercy would fall upon them, that you would touch their hearts, open their eyes that they may see truth, truth that they have shied away from, but Lord, you can make them see it. Oh Lord, have mercy, we pray. We thank you, God, that you're so good. We love you, we love you, we want to honour you and give you thanks forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Peter. How great is our God and pride is really the enemy. So now, the final hymn of the night is Oh, Worship the King. Please stand if you're able. Thank you. Oh, uh-huh.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how great is our God. He removed king and set up kings. He is able to help and to cast down. All who work in pride, he is able to cast down. Yet he resists the proud, but give grace to humble, and he give more grace. O oh Lord, please help us to be humbled, to serve you all the days of our lives, that we may receive blessings from you, O oh God, for you resist the proud, but give, praise, give grace to the humble. And Father, also, as we have said, a calling to, to, to go and preach the gospel, be patient and persevere like Daniel to, king, to, to his king, and help us, O oh Lord, to be persevere to our friends who are not saved, to persevere, to, be, to speak the truth in love, for they need to hear the truth. Let we not forsake them, but be patient, pray for them, wait on the Lord, and preach the gospel whenever you can, whenever we can, whenever you give us the opportunity to. Oh Lord, let me be a faithful and good servant to do your will. We pray that your will be done, not our wills, but your will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. And thank you for tonight, oh God. Please be with us now as we go to our house. Let we have to keep your word remain in our mind. Let us keep your word and be obedient until the end. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.